Todd Moore from University of Maryland. He will talk about the existence and large time behavior in hydrodynamic swarming. So first of all, thank you uh, to, to Professor Ha. Thank you for the invitation. It's really my pleasure. Um, and uh, welcome all. Uh, hello from Maryland, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, here it's the morning in Maryland. Okay, I see all the admissions. And uh, let me start. Um, I will talk about uh, the large time behavior and the existence uh, questions uh, in the system of PDEs that arise uh, from the um, models of swarming. So this is the second part, the hydrodynamic swarming. Um, I will describe, I mean, there's a lot of work that has been done in the last 10 years, uh, which is pretty exciting. And the, the host here can, can uh, is sharing this, this excitement. Uh, I will focus on uh, a, a string of recent results, which were uh, are being published these days. So I would like to, um, uh, to excuse myself for not mentioning references to every piece of work that was done in the last uh, 10 or 20 years in this topic. So without further ado, let me start. Um, and this is a good point. Just a second, I have to delete this. I have to do a few things here. Okay, so let me start uh, with the notion of alignment. So that's a good starting point with the work of uh, Cooker and Smell from 2007. It's uh, by now a classical model where we have capital N. I believe that you, you, you do see my, my mouse. There are capital N agents uh, and they are identified by their positions X and by the velocity V. And the, the key element is an alignment dynamics which is um, outlined here where the change in the velocity of agent I is balanced by a weighted average of the difference between the velocity of each agent and the velocity of the neighbors, which are indexed here by J. The dynamics takes place uh, in a, uh, the ambient space is omega, which uh, in order to avoid boundary conditions, I will take it to be either the whole space or just the torus. And this system of uh, NODEs, this is the starting point for our discussion. Here are the, the weights phi ij, which will be explored in a second. And the description here is a description of alignment. Alignment is a statement where there are pairwise interaction outlined here, which steer towards an averaging heading. That, that's, that's basically the statement. And uh, this is a key ingredient in self-organization in many um, models for social interactions, either in ecology, when you think about flocking of birds or swarming of bacteria or insects or cells, in human interaction, the alignment of pedestrian, uh, all the way to emergence of, con uh, in opinion dynamics, the emergence of consensus and sensor-based ne uh, networks, swarming of mobile robots to macromolecules, and there are many more examples. So a key feature in all these models is this alignment, which is written here, which I will try to explore during the lecture. Now, in, in, this, in this dynamics, everything is dictated by the communication kernel phi. Um, just one second, I have to hide something. Now it works. Everything is dictated by the communication kernel phi and the phi ij here are the communication kernel between the position of the agent i and the other, uh, the other agent at position j. And I will normalize this kernel so that the integral will be one. Okay, so this is the general setup. We have uh, capital N agents in little n dimension. Um, and um, they are driven by this communication kernel uh, little phi. Uh, which depends on the position of myself, agent I, and my neighbors, agent J. We normalize it. Tau is some positive parameter which um, dictates the amplitude of this alignment process. And uh, the rules of engagement depends really on this choice of this kernel phi. This is not dictated from above and there are many origin for this kernel. And the, the choice of the kernel is context dependent. Let me mention a few examples. The phenomenological approach, we just take here is this is in this example, which goes back to Cooker Smale, 
it's something which decays algebraically with the distance between a position X and position X prime. So this is an algebraic decay, which makes sense that the further we are uh, from another agent, then the decay uh, of the influence of the communication, there is some sort of decay which is described here. Another source is empirical. For example, it's learned from the data and there are many works in this direction. Uh, and I gave here only one reference, uh, the, the group of Magioni, uh, where they learn from the data what is the shape of this kernel communication kernel phi. And then a third uh, source for the kernel phi, which is my favorite, is driven from higher principle. So here is a model for anticipation, which was originally introduced by Wenenberg and, and his co-authors. And the idea is that we see now the dynamics driven by the potential, but the reaction is, uh, for this potential, the reaction is given in terms of the, in terms of the anticipated position of the neighbors. Okay, there are many things which are run on my screen, so I have to delete them constantly, sorry. So the idea here is that the dynamics is driven by the anticipated position rather than by the position itself. The anticipated position is the current position plus a small parameter taking into account the local velocity. What it means really is that when tau equal to zero, this is the usual end body problem. When tau is positive, if we expand the right hand side for small tau, then the first term gives us uh, the term which is expanded here, where u prime um, is, has to do with the derivative of this potential, which is assumed to be radial, as you can see. And then the second term, which is of interest, gives us exactly the term of alignment that we had before, but now we have matrices here. So this, this, this term represents anticipation, which leads to alignment. And these matrices have to do with some average Hessian of the original potential. And the first term is the usual repulsion plus attraction. So it's repulsive uh, when u prime is positive, attractive when, u, uh, attractive when u prime is positive, and repulsive when u prime is negative. And here we have, in some sense, the new aspect, which is the alignment term we had before in a matrix form. If we take the scalar case, then we get the cooker smell model. So this is, in some sense, a der derivation of the cooker smell model from a higher principle. In this case, it's a model for anticipation. Okay. So uh, I should say here that what we have is essentially a model which includes three rules of engagement, alignment, repulsion, and attraction. In this talk, I will focus mainly on alignment. But I should mention that everything began uh, with alignment, repulsion, and attraction with the work of Craig Reynolds, really a pioneering work in 1987, uh, where he wanted to make a realistic description for flocking of what he called voids. And the best way to describe it will be simply by uh, a movie. So what you see here are the voids of Craig Reynolds driven by alignment repulsion and attraction, which is a pretty realistic uh, dynamics to something which looks like flocking. And uh, if we wait uh, a little bit and we see that we turn off the alignment, even though we leave the attraction and repulsion, then you see that the, the behavior is fundamentally different. And now the alignment is turned off and you can see that you get a completely different behavior. So clearly the alignment is a um, key component in self-organized uh, self dynamics. And this is the main feature that I would like to focus in this work. So as you can see here, now they are wandering around, alignment is turned on, and then uh, there is some order and some self-organization is coming back into the model. But I should mention that alignment is not the only feature uh, the work of uh, Reynolds, uh, what is called the tree zone protocol, alignment, uh, uh, attraction and repulsion. So this is the tree zone protocol. And um, uh, today there is still no mathematical theory in particular to the local aspect of this tree zone uh, modeling. Okay, so what are the questions that I'm interested or the questions that are being asked and are still not clear? 
Well, one question that I'm very much interested in the last few years is, uh, in the Cooker smell model, there is one over N. Why N? No one counting anything. So N is really, uh, is not plugged into the system. N is nothing but a scaling factor. And over the years, there are various models where there are different factors. Instead of the N being uniform for the whole crowd, the N now depends on the agent. Um, I, will not, I will not explore that. In fact, there is not just a question of scaling, there is a question of multi-scaling, which is very fundamental, which leads to multi-flocking. That's, that's a topic of a separate lecture. If I'll have time, then I will briefly mention something about this N. So I want to share with you my concern about the weakness of this scaling one over N. In some sense, it's just for convenience. Another question is uh, the different classes of interaction uh, for interaction kernels. Since they are not dictated from above, the question is, what is the file that we should use? So in the literature, there are various classes. Let me mention a few. The first is a metric kernel, where the phi depends on the distance between the position x and x prime, x being a typical agent, and x prime is a typical neighbor. For example, in the original cooker smell model, I mentioned already there was this kind of um, algebraic decay with some uh, parameter uh, gamma here. And what is important in the cooker smell model are, are two things. The behavior, actually, the, the important thing is the behavior as R tends to infinity. This is in sharp contrast to a singular kernel, like a risk potential here where now we are interested in the behavior for agents which are very close, R is very close to one, or R tends to infinity depending on the power of gamma. So these are two examples for metric kernels, but this does not include everything. Here's another class of topological kernels. Now the phi, the, the, namely the rule of engagement between agent at position X and X prime depends on the number of agents between some enclosing region between X and X prime. The statement here states that the interaction depends on the crowdedness, which is very reasonable in many um, situations where the propagation of information is not just in a, a vacuum, but it really depends how crowded the region, how many agents are between X and X prime in some average sense. So these are topological kernels. And then uh, another class of kernels are cutoff kernels, which were introduced in the, another classical model, which will not talk about the Vickshuk model, which is a characteristic function, let's say, of a ball. And the important thing here is that we are completely uninterested what happens in R, when R uh, is, is much larger than one. We are just interested at moderate R. So these are local or cutoff kernels. So here are different classes of kernels, and there are many more I will not cover. But I would like to raise the following fundamental question. Here's the key questions. How different classes of kernels affect the large time behavior? That's the question I'm interested in. To address this question, let me, uh, the question of large time behavior, let me uh, uh, go back to the original uh, Cooker Smail. So these are the velocities. This is the intensity of the alignment. Phi ij is the rule of engagement, is a kernel, which here I take, actually it could be any symmetric kernel, and we associate this dynamic, this dynamics a weighted graph. The graph consists of the vertices where the agents are, and the edges whenever these two agents talk, namely whenever phi ij is greater than zero. So we have here a graph, and uh, we would like to look now at the energy fluctuation for these dynamics and the energy fluctuation is defined here. It's the sum of all the VI minus VJ squared. This is the L2 uh, energy fluctuation. And the key statement is here. And the statement says that the rate of change of the energy fluctuation equals to the quantity here, which is called entropy. I will discuss this. And this quantity is upper bounded by a scalar factor multiplying the the same energy fluctuation that we began with, so we can close this inequality by a Gornwell approach. So we just have to understand this equality one and inequality two. Equality one has to do with the fact that the term phi ij vj minus vi is, uh, is anti-symmetric. 
So the assumption is that the phi ij are symmetric, they need not be even a function of the distance, any symmetric interaction will do, because if the phi ij are symmetric, the vj minus vi are anti-symmetric, and then if we take this equation and we multiply by vi and sum it, then by the anti-symmetry, we get the term that we have here, and the term here takes into account the fluctuations, but only those fluctuations between VI and VJ that talk to each other, namely when I and J belongs to the having a, an edge. If there is no communication, then there is no decrease in these fluctuations. And the question now is, how do we go from this quantity, which is the enstrophy, to this inequality, or put it uh, differently, how we can, we can take the phi ij outside and paying the price of a scalar multiple, a scalar multiplier. To do this, we have to define the graph Laplacian. A graph Laplacian is nothing but the original adjacency matrix phi, which is given here, where we place in the diagonal the sum of each row. So we put minus the term for each phi ij, and then we put the sum of the terms in the diagonal, we get here a symmetric matrix, which is positive definite, not semi-definite. And in fact, this dynamics on the top is nothing but a heat equation with this graph Laplacian and the minus here is because this graph Laplacian is positive, unlike the usual Laplacian in mathematics, which are negative. And then if we look at this um, dynamics of the graph Laplacian, it follows that uh, this equality, this, this term on the right hand side is bounded from above by minus tau. And then here, the, the, this quantity in red eta is precisely the second eigenvalue of the graph Laplacian, as we know in, in the usual case from the usual Laplacians. So I will not um, elaborate here because we will have to do it in great detail later on. So we get a, a sharp estimate in terms of the second eigenvalue of this matrix, which is the graph Laplacian. And then uh, once we plug here the graph Laplacian, we integrate this Gronwell inequality and we conclude that the energy fluctuations are bounded from above by this scalar multiplier multiplying the initial uh, energy fluctuations. So now the question is whether or not this integrand tends to infinity. If it tends to infinity, the fluctuation will tend to zero. If the fluctuation tends to zero, then the large time behavior will be that all the velocities would like to approach a common limit. So the question is now, what happens with this second uh, eigenvalue? And the second eigenvalue here is called the Fiddler number. And what it reflects is the, the connectivity of the graph. The connectivity of the graph in the usual sense that every agent or every um, node is connected to every node through a path uh, where the information propagates. So if the graph is connected, in fact, slightly more than connected, if the graph is integrably connected, then we get unconditional flocking in the sense that all the velocities will approach a limiting behavior. So this is the large time behavior of this Kukla smell model. And the, the only if here is the behavior of the second eigenvalue of the graph Laplacian. And the second eigenvalue of the graph Laplacian still leaves us with the open question about the connectivity of the graph. Now, uh, before I'm leaving the discrete case, uh, I should say that I stop here because this question, um, this is, a, seminar in PDEs, this question is basically open. It's basically open. In order to move from something is open with something I can say more, I will move now from the discrete case to the continuum. And this is done uh, by taking the large crowd dynamics. There are many works that were done in this direction. I, I just mentioned a uh, few. Uh, the important thing, uh, the most recent one are by Natalini, Natalini and Paul and Schweitkoi. And the idea is the passage from the agent-based description to the hydrodynamic description. So let me do it in some um, not precise way. The idea is that we define the empirical distribution, which is given here. And we end up with a... Um, kinetic formulation. And the kinetic formulation tells us the transport 
of this empirical distribution. So it's being transported and it's also subject to this um, by agent interaction, which is defined by this quadratic term. And this quadratic term takes into account all the binary interactions, the alignment, possibly repulsion, noise and everything else. In the case of alignment, the idea is that the agent at, look, at position X with velocity V interacts with the agents. Uh, this is a probability measure with agents with position X prime with velocity V prime. We take into account all the other agents. And the important thing is that they are weighted by this communication kernel. Now, this large crowd dynamics is captured by two moments, the first two moments. So I will assume that the integral over all velocities of the zeros in the first moment exist without further uh, description or words. I will just assume that this is true under certain assumptions. And then we end up with the hydrodynamic description in terms of the density rho and the momentum rho u. And this is the beginning of the PDE talk when we end up with a mass equation, the usual mass equation, and the usual momentum equation. So this is the momentum, this is the pressure tensor, and the only change from the usual um, hydrodynamic description is of course the alignment term. And they are given as follows. The pressure is, is a symmetric positive definite matrix given by the assumed to exist limit of the second moments of F. This is a rank one matrix. And the alignment term is a vector term, which is given here, which takes into account the velocity of an agent at position X. It interacts with all the other agents at position X prime. It takes into account the density at position X prime. We take into, we integrate all the other uh, neighbors with this communication weight. And here's the alignment term. So there are two terms in this uh, hydrodynamic description, the pressure and the alignment. The alignment is really what carries the information about the um, agent-based description, the alignment model. And the pressure, of course, requires a closure. So a uh, few words that I would like to mention here. Uh, this is not an hydrodynamic model because I didn't tell you how I close. This P still depends on the second moment. Uh, of the kinetic formulation. And we have to do something from the outside in order to close the system. This is the point of departure in my talk from a lot of uh, literature. Most of the literature closed this model either by a monokinetic closure, we just assume that P vanishes, or some simple closure which is different than Maxwellian in order to proceed. I will not do that. All my talk will be relevant to general system, even though I will not close the pressure here. So that's a point number one. And I would like to bring here uh, a quotation um, from, from a very, I think, important paper by Vikshek and Zephris. And they mentioned, of course, this pressure has to do with the internal energy, which I will not elaborate right now. They said that in, um, dynamics of flocking and swarming, the source of energy making the motion possible, these are not relevant. And therefore, in other words, they say, we completely ignore this uh, pressure term and there is no need even to conserve the momentum. It is true, however, my point of view is that the lack of thermal equilibrium and all these things, of course, are related to the fact that how do we close the pressure the lack of thermal equilibrium, even though we lack equalities, I would like to substitute these equalities by these inequalities. And in particular, I would like to close this inequality by decay of energy fluctuations. So even though for the people who are not familiar with this topic, I would like to say that this is a critical point. How do we close this system? And my statement here, I will try to pursue as much as possible the analysis without closing the system at all, but due to the fact of the existence of alignment. And we will see that alignment is a pretty strong forcing. So let's talk about energy fluctuations. So the energy fluctuations, I'll continue now, we take the second moment, and this of course is the usual total energy, 
which can be decomposed into kinetic and internal energies according to this simple um, decomposition. So one half V squared is one half U squared, one half V minus U squared, and then uh, this inner product. Now, when we integrate the V, this term drops out and the total energy here drops into two components. The one half U squared, the blue term, this is the kinetic energy, and then we have the internal energy. So we have kinetic and internal energy. And now the energy fluctuations, I would like to consider now the energy fluctuation which correspond to the discrete energy fluctuation that we had before. And here are the energy fluctuations. They are the macroscopic fluctuations in the macroscopic velocity, the, the difference squares between U and U prime. And then I take a symmetric sum of the kinetic, uh, the internal fluctu energy fluctuations, observe that this little e is really the internal fluctuations around the average velocity u. So this will be the energy fluctuation. And just as we had in the discrete case, we have the following statement. The rate of change of the energy fluctuation defined here is equals to the same energy fluctuated fluctuations weighted by phi. This is a pretty strong statement, which goes back actually to uh, our original paper with Ha, my original paper with Ha, uh, even though I have to, to, to admit, we have to correct there, there are some typos there. Uh, so this is a pretty strong uh, statement and the importance of this statement that this applies independently of the closure. In fact, if phi equal to zero is simply the conservation of the energy. This is just a conservation of the energy and then in general, in the case of a general uh, interaction, we have the decay of the fluctuation dictated by this quantity. Of course, the question is how negative this quantity is, namely how negative the entropy is. Namely, we are now looking for the second question. We are looking for an inequality of the type that this is a scalar multiplier. Uh, we are looking for this scalar multiplier multiplying the energy fluctuations. So the question is, is there such a scalar multiplier? And that's what I would like to discuss next. And this is done by spectral analysis. And much of what I'm discussing today is actually in, in an upcoming uh, article that will be uh, on mathematics of swarming that will uh, be appearing on the notices of the AMS. So the first thing to notice is that we have internal fluctuations. Let me denote by phi convolution rho this interval, even if phi is not metric, then it's easy to see simply because of the additive nature of the internal, um, uh, internal energy that it appears in the fluctuations, that this integral weighted with phi is bounded from below, and that's what we are looking for. We are now looking for a lower bound for this entropy is bounded from below by the double integral of the sum of the um, internal energies. So we have now this one scalar multiplier, which has to do with the mean of phi convolution with rho. Of course, more complicated term will be, what do we do with these uh, macroscopic fluctuations? So we have to look at the hydrodynamic fluctuations given here. This, this, is, this is, means simply rho, rho prime, dx, dx prime. To this end, uh, I introduced a weighted Laplacian operator. A weighted Laplacian, this is a Hilbert-Schmidt operator, and I restricted my attention now to the torus. And the weighted Laplacian, it's weighted by the density, is defined as follows. So this is a precise weighting as it should. It just fits into this theory and observe that this operator is symmetric. It's clearly symmetric and it's no negative Laplacian. The reason that it's no negative is when you, um, act, when it acts on a weighted vector function. So W is a vector function weighted by the square root of the density, you get precisely a positive term. So that, that's the key definition here. And then uh, this operator in Hilbert Schmidt, it's a symmetric, no negative. It has a discrete spectrum, lambda one, less equal than lambda two and so forth. And we know even what is the first eigenvalue. The first eigenvalue is zero. The reason it's zero is because we have an eigenfunction, which is a constant function weighted by the square root row. If you plug here the square root row up to a constant vector function, you get zero. So the first eigenvalue is zero as it should with the Laplacian. 
And therefore, we come now to the second eigenvalue. And the second eigenvalue by classic results is of course the infimum of over all vector functions which are orthogonal to the first eigenfunction. And you can see here this inner product I already told you, it gives us precisely what we get on the entropy. This is exactly the L2 rho norm of W because the inner product vanishes by orthogonality. But this ratio is precisely what we are looking for in order to bound the entropy. So we have now a sharp lower bound on the entropy that this integral of the weighted uh, fluctuation of the velocity is bounded by the second eigenvalue. Now it's not the discrete Laplacian, now it is weighted Laplacian that I just introduced. And so we have a bound on the energy fluctuations and our theorem therefore says that now the energy is decaying by a scalar multiplier, multiplier which has to do with the mean between the spectral, um, the, the second eigenvalue of this um, operator, and of course the minimal value of phi convolution rho, you remember the internal energy. Now this statement applies to any mesoscopic pressure, independent of the pressure, which is quite, uh, I would say, remarkable, and it applies to arbitrary symmetric kernel. It need not be a metric. And of course, the question, which is not trivial, is now to find lower bounds for the second term and the, for the second eigenvalue, and of course, for the convolution. Now, let me start with the convolution for uh, talking about long range interactions, the lower bound for the um, convolution, this bounded clearly taking into account that we normalize phi is bounded by the minimum of the, 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 the kernel. So I will take here the minimum of the kernel and the second eigenvalue of L also is bounded by the minimum value of this kernel. So this gives us a requirement of global communication. If the minimum of the kernel is bounded away from zero, of course, we will get exponential decay and hence we get the large time behavior for the uh, models for the Euler alignment models that I mentioned before. So let me look now at the class of kernels with this Pareto tail. So we will assume that these kernels decay, uh, they are need not depend just on the distance, but they have a lower bound which decays in this kind of a Pareto tail behavior. So in this case, we have to introduce the diameter of the crowd. This is the diameter depending on the support of fraud, the diameter of the support of rho and the immediate corollary for arbitrary pressure is if there is a strong solution driven by long range kernel, long range kernel means that this gamma is positive, then we get this, of course, this kind of estimate because this uh, diameter is a lower bound for this kind of behavior. So now we have to see what happens with the diameter of the, um, the crowd and we get a flocking, which is a prototype of swarming behavior, and the following statement is true. If the diameter does not spread too much, say by um, uh, range of order beta, and if beta times gamma is less than one, then the fluctuation decays to zero. These are the macroscopic fluctuations and the internal fluctuations as well. So there's an if here, the question is whether or not we can control the, 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 disperse, the dispersive effect of the crowd and to what range, and let me just mention two examples for long range flocking. Uh, for example, um, if the velocities are uniformly bounded, clearly the diameter of the flock can be not, not larger than T, and then we get the fractional exponential decay. In fact, if we have a monokinetic closure, if we now assume that there is no pressure, in this case, it is known, there's a lot of literature about that, that the diameter remains bounded and there is exponential decay. So I think I mentioned a few, I mean, I, in particular, I should mention here the result of high and U, it goes back to, there are many results in this direction. I would like to mention another result in this direction, another example, let's take the matrix valued kernels of Kruger-Smell. That's fundamentally different because now we have coupled system. In this case, if the matrix is bounded, it's decaying by uh, this Pareto tail. So this averaging means this, this, this definition. Uh, it has this kind of decay, then uh, it can be shown that the diameter does not grow faster than some power beta, which has to do with two over 
two minus gamma, and therefore we get flocking if gamma is less than two thirds. So, okay. So these are examples of long range and the flocking behavior that we get in this case are either traveling wave, uh, this is a, a canonical example, or we get, if we add a potential, we get harmonic oscillator and here's just another uh, simulation just to show you that it's more interesting than just a, tra a traveling wave in a straight path. And what you see here is the concentration of the group along a harmonic oscillator. Okay, since time is running short, let me move now to short range interactions. And in the case of short range interaction, we cannot assume that phi is uniformly bounded from below. So now I'll restrict attention to um, metric kernel and I would like to try to estimate the entropy along the lines of what I've done before. What will be a lower bound for the entropy? So a lower bound for the internal energy is easy because phi convolution rho is now bounded by the minimum of the density. What about the entropy? It turns out that in this case, the second eigenvalue of the operator introduced is bounded from below by a constant, which is specifically given by this Fourier coefficient of the um, communication kernel, the radial communication kernel. And it has to do with the minimal value of the density and the maximal value of the density. And I still do not like that this is not symmetric, but I cannot prove it without the two. It's apparently true, but I was unable to. This is not the point. The point is that as a consequence of this theorem, if we can bind the second eigenvalue, and if we know already that the internal energy has to do with the minimal density, so we can see that in both cases, the minimal density is a critical component. And in fact, immediately corollary is that as long as the maximal variation of the density is not too large in a way specified here, then this ratio of the densities is bounded from below and we get exponential decay. So here are a few examples. If we have one dimensional dynamics, uh, in a, a, which is su supported on an interval, then we get exponential decay. And the same thing happens with two-dimensional dynamics. These are results which I was looking for for a long time, and I'm pretty pleased with these results, except because they are independent of the support of phi, they are independent of the pressure, they are independent of the internal energy. However, the key issue is what is the behavior of the density? So at this stage, we see that the density, which is usually a silent variable in many hydrodynamic equations, here is the most important, it's much more important than the velocity because the density being away from vacuum is the thing that enables connectivity. It enables propagation of information and the lower bound of the density, it has to be assumed. So far, I was unable to, to cover that. So this is an example, one example for short range kernel. The other example for short range interactions where we can prove things, for example, when we have short, um, singular kernels. So here's an example for a singular kernels, which is compactly supported. And in this case, uh, this is a, an older result with Roman Schweitkoi. If the density is bounded from below with a certain rate, then smooth solution must flow. So again, we see that we have to control in some manner the density from below and it's left open. There is an if here, which we are unable to prove. In this case, we get unconditional flocking for short range non-vacuous interactions. There are cases where these things can be removed and I mentioned here a few results in the one dimensional case, uh, but in general, the connectivity to non-vacuous density is still open. Let me go to a third option uh, example for short range interaction, which has to do with topological kernels. I mentioned them before, where we take the distance between two positions at X and Y, not to be the metric distance, but the distance which is weighted by the density enclosed between them in some domain, which is denoted here by Omega. So this is, is the dictated to be a region of communication. And then we look at a short range protocol. It's short range because it's cut off within a ball of radius R0, and it takes into account the density so that the communication is inversely proportional to the crowdedness. The crowded it is, there is less communication. The less crowded, then there is increase in communication. And this has to do with the topological uh, description. Uh, I do not have time now to explore why it is topological. 
So we now look at this kind of model, there is no pressure. And then we showed that in this case, smooth non vacuum solution, assuming that it's bounded away from the uh, vacuum mass flow. So this is the third example. And finally, let me go to the fourth example uh, for um, multi-species. Um, in this case, um, there is not only one, uh, one equation, but there are collection of equations. These are multi-species. And you can see that now the velocities um, depend uh, on a index alpha, which dictates what the species is. What is the difference between one species and another species? The way they communicate in between. So if all the phi's are the same, you get one species. If the different phi alphas, uh, alpha betas, then you get different species. So uh, in this case, you get flocking. And again, I have to skip a lot of details, but the key element here is that this matrix of communication has to be connected exactly along the same lines as before. Connectivity is measured by the second eigenvalue of a weighted Laplacian, and which is quantified here. The details are not important, but the message is important that connectivity is the key aspect for this large time behavior. In fact, what we, happen, we have here is a sort of a game. For example, if you have two groups, one talks with the other, but with not with its own kind, nevertheless, in the long range, in the, in the, for a long time, they will uh, coincide in the same direction. Okay, I will skip the other talk, what is the or origin of this multi-species, and uh, I would like to talk also about the existence of strong solutions. Uh, how many minutes do I have, Sian? Uh, we have five minutes. Okay, that's fine. Well, we have a, a seven minutes. Okay, so uh, this is the second part, uh, and it's important part because all the statements that I said before, they, they, they had of the following flavor. If rho u is a strong solution, then so and so. What about this if? That's the question that I would like to ask. So we look at the system, and I would like to know whether or not it admits global small solution. So here there are two competing mechanisms. First of all, there is the usual steepening of local fluctuations where the gradients want to tend to minus infinity. And at the same time, we have alignment and it tames the fluctuations and then it uh, induces the divergence to be bounded from below. The question is who wins? Of course, I cannot answer this question now without the closure on the pressure P. So I will take the monokinetic closure and I will assume uh, that the P is different from zero. P is different from zero. And then we have a balance between the Euler dynamics, Eulerian dynamics and the alignment. But before I'm doing that, here is something very interesting. When you look at this system, behind the system, there is another equation for the internal energy. The internal energy is the internal energy I defined before. And in fact, the internal energy uses, usually satisfy this equation equal to zero. But in case of the alignment, on the right hand side, we get a new term. And the term has to do with the trace of the normalized pressure matrix and the alignment term, which is given here, as we know before. If tau equal to zero, so these are the usual Euler equations. Now, it turns out, and this is a nice exercise, that if you have a matrix whose trace is one, and this is true for p bar, if you take the trace of a normalized matrix p bar times the gradient of u and other matrix, the gradient of u is the usual uh, stress tensor, it's always bounded by the minimal eigenvalue of the symmetric part of this tensor. And this statement is independent of the pressure on the internal energy. So we start with something in the thermodynamic level, we end up with something which has to do with the dynamics. And using this simple exercise, we look for a threshold which is independent of the thermodynamics. Namely, we want this scalar multiplier, J, to be positive, bounded away from below, bounded away from zero. Why? Because if it's bounded away from zero, then the total amount of the internal energy by integration will decay. So we impose this kind of decay as a motivation. Well, we would like to prove it, it's very nice, but uh, the question is, is it true? In fact, the question is, assume that this eta indicator is initially bounded from below, which we can assume. Does this persist in time? 
That's a general question that I'm posing. And I would like to address it in the case that there is a monokinetic closure. Of course, in the general case, it's, it's, one has to be specific. Now, this condition is interesting because in the one dimensional case, it is true. In fact, in the one dimensional case, if we take the system that we had before in the one dimensional case, it is well known that there is a global smooth solution if and only if the initial condition satisfy this threshold condition, which means that the minimal value of the derivative plus the phi convolution rho zero is bounded from below by zero. And the same thing is true for the two-dimensional problem. Uh, it's equivalent to what I'm showing here. And this led me to the following general theorem. So we consider now an Eulerian, general Eulerian dynamics. There is no pressure. We would like to know about the global existence in any number of dimensions. So this is an Euler alignment system subject to non-vacuous initial data, which are sufficiently smooth. And we assume a threshold condition, which reads the following. The initial eigenvalue of the symmetric part of the gradient of U plus tau times phi convolution rho is bounded by a constant given here. The most important thing is that this statement allows these numbers to be negative, not just positive because this quantity is positive and this quantity is positive and together we allow these eigenvalues to run into negative values. Then the minimal value, I mean, this quantity remains bounded by uh, this uh, threshold and the equation that means global smooth solution. So this is a global existence under this threshold. And another important question is to develop a theory for weak solution for this system. Another question of existence applied to singular kernels. And we know that in the case of singular kernels, which involves, um, which involve uh, topological distance, there exists global solution. This result goes to Schweitgoy and myself. I believe that uh, I, I stop here uh, about the question of existence. I would like to thank you uh, for your attention. And I'll take the advantage that uh, the topic en enables me to put very nice video. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll have a qu uh, uh, any questions and comments. Okay, I, I think, can I ask uh, one question? Yes. If uh, in your in your uh, one of the theorem that you show us, if rho uh, minus is bounded by one over square to t, then you have a flocking. Could you explain to me why uh, how one over square to t appear naturally there? Uh, uh, yes. So you can see that. Okay. Um, let me say. You see that I, I, I uh, there is one theorem when I have one over t, which is apparently the right decay. Uh, the point is that here is we have the one over square root t that you are referring to. This is the case that we have singular kernels. Oh, okay. In the case of a singular kernels, if the density is bounded below by one over square root t, it looks like a very ideal um, theorem, but I'm not proud of it because I know that this is not a, a sharp, this condition is too, um, it too, it's too strong, uh, then smooth solution must look. Now, to, so first of all, I would like to take uh, and to, to criticize this, not to criticize this theorem, but to put it in the, the, appropriate, in the proper light. Now, where, does, where is the source of the square root, you ask? Well, it's the same point where this square root appears. Just a second. Is the same source? I'll explain in a second. I'll explain in a second. Uh, just one second. I have to find it. Yes, it's the same source for this row. Mm -hmm. So what happens in the uh, singular case, so let's, let's look at this theorem. Uh, 
Uh, you just have to believe me that in the case that you have singular kernels, this is not this case, in the case of a singular kernel, we do know that the maximum of the density is bounded from above. So that's not an issue. So the real question now is, when can we say that this quantity is integ the integral tends to infinity? So you can see that the borderline is exactly when the minimal of the density is like one over square root t, the I rational see. behavior. Yeah. So they are all tied together to the same thing. Uh, can we improve uh, uh, this, this square root? And in fact, what can we say? So the message, take home message is really, what can we say about these models, the hydrodynamic uh, swarming? What can we say about the behavior of the density? Uh, because this framework, uh, the spectral analysis and so forth, tell us that uh, if we know something about the density, the density is the medium which carries the information of connectivity. And then uh, this large literature that you're familiar, of course, uh, about what happened with uh, global interaction kernels applied to uh, local interaction kernels. Now, local interaction kernels, of course, are much more realistic models. And uh, to address this question, it reduces now the problem to the behavior of the density. So to your question, is the same problem why I have here the square? And it's the same problem now, what can I say about a lower bound of the density? Okay, so thank you. Uh, any, any other questions and comments? Uh, I, I have a question. Yes. Yes, uh, please. Can we go back to page 23? Wow. Hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, so here, uh, phi is uh, scalar value, right? Here, phi is scalar, yes. Uh, so then can you obtain some kind of this kind of uh, global strong solution result for a uh, matrix valued kernel? I mean, the, as you said in the previous pages for like- uh, Yes, 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 I understand exactly, I understand. I understand exactly. Uh, I understand your question. Uh, um, I mean that if this, this kernel is- yeah, yeah, I understand. Uh, okay. I, um, I do not know. I mean, it's a very interesting question. Uh -huh. If not only, I, I do not know, not that I do not know if it's true, I do not know even if it can be done uh, because what is behind this theorem, is, uh, there, there are a lot of technical data, which is, um, uh, um, so if phi is a matrix, uh, I, I never, that, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. And I, I cannot even, um, I have to, to, to go back and to see, I don't know. It, I it's see, a fantastic question to prove global existence when there is a phi, uh, uh, I see. So actually, I see. Yeah, I don't know. That's very interesting because in the one dimensional, so phi, if you have a matrix, it's dimension um, D by D. And uh, I see in the scalar, in the one dimensional case, it must be scalar. So the question already mm -hmm. appears in the two dimensional case. Uh, and I never thought about it. I don't know. That's a very good question. In I fact, uh, it is a good question because uh, as I try to hint here, the original Cooker's mail goes with a scalar interaction kernel, whereas uh, um, one derivation of the Cooker's mail leads actually to a matrix interaction yeah. in a very natural manner. Yes, uh, yes, yes. So, yes. And, and there, there are more than one works about uh, matrix interactions, but it's not clear, I mean, besides the matrix form. So I try to explain why it follows from higher principle. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be very interesting to 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 get, to raise this theory into the matrix case. Yeah, I see. Thank you very much. Okay. Other questions and comments. Okay. Uh, any any other questions? <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, 
Okay, so if not, uh, then let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Jan, yeah. Uh, do we have uh, something to say? Yeah, just a few words. We uh, Jan, your, your speaker uh, is, is off. Right, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so what I was saying is basically what I just wrote in the chat. Uh, so uh, thanks, first of all, to, to both of you, to uh, our chair and speaker today. Uh, it was a very nice session, I think. And also thanks to everybody for joining us today. Uh, next week, we have another talk at the same place in the same time. Uh, you can use the same link again next week. Uh, talk by Diogo Gomez from uh, Kaust. Uh, and, and sorry to everybody for the confusion in the reminder email. There was a uh, not working link, actually, I think, for many people. Uh, the Zoom link was wrong. In any case, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, to all of you, good night. Seung, uh, thank you for staying up so late. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Aitan, uh, thanks thank a lot. You, have, a, have a nice thank day. You much. Uh, thank you. And everybody else, uh, have a nice day as well. Good night, uh, or whatever the time is. Thanks a lot. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye bye.